So tonight we're going to talk about, we're going to speak from the topic of learning to walk. Learning to walk. And when it comes to the things of the kingdom, which my wife spoke about, she talked about the kingdom. There's a lot of things that we have to relearn as we endeavor to walk with God and to have a kingdom perspective on this life that he's called us, called us to live. Amen. And so when you think of what it means to, when I say learning to walk, it's learning to live your life in alignment with God after you've made the decision to actually dedicate your life to him. Because if you're like me, Jesus, hearing the name Jesus is not new to you. We all know Jesus. We all know that he died on the cross. He was buried and he was raised from the dead. And if we choose to live in him, we can have everlasting life, right? But knowing that and living your life in a way where you're surrendering to him and you're actually dying to your flesh, like you're allowing yourself to die in response to his death for you, that's when walking with him actually begins. I've gone to the altar a number of times only to leave and do the same thing I did prior to going to the altar. So that's an acknowledgement of me knowing Jesus, but not committing to his purpose and not committing to his way of living life not adopting kingdom practices and principles into my own life to reap the fruit that he has for me, right? So when I say learning to walk, this is something that it's not easy. Following Christ is simple. The steps are simple, right? He causes all things to work together for good for those that love him and for those that are called according to his purpose. And the word also says, if you love him, you will obey his commands. So if we follow the word and we obey what, what Jesus tells us to do, then we're, we're in right standing. We're in alignment. So follow what Jesus says and you're good. Don't and repent and continue to have to get yourself back in right standing whenever you're out of alignment. So it's easy. It's simple, but it's not easy because as human beings, as people, we were born with our intentions bent towards evil. This is in Genesis 8, right? Human being, man's heart is bent towards evil from birth. And the evidence of this in my house are my kids. My kids remind me daily that we are born with evil intentions. I don't have to teach my kids to not share. I don't have to teach my kids to fight. I don't have to teach my kids how to throw toys when they're frustrated. I don't have to teach my kids how to fall out in the middle of Publix when they can't get a car that's only going to break after two times of rolling that thing. I don't have to teach them how to act out in public. That comes natural. So there's certain things, even in those that have, have, have confessed Christ, there's certain things that are evil that come natural. And learning to walk requires that we unlearn the things that have come so natural to us in our carnality. And so I want to look at 2 Corinthians 5, starting in verse 6. And it says, we walk by faith and not by sight. So as we go through the word today, you're going to find a correlation between walking in faith and vision, an absence of sight. You're going to see that in multiple scriptures. So we walk by faith and not by sight. And when Paul wrote this, he was actually encouraging people for the life that is to come. What my wife talked about, the, the kingdom that we will at some point enter into, right? Where we will have heavenly bodies, we'll shed these earthly bodies and we will go into heaven and we will receive what God has for us in the heavenly realm, right? So he was encouraging people. He said in verse six, so, so we are always confident knowing that while we are at home in this body, we are absent from the Lord. Verse seven, for we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, yes, well pleased rather, to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. So he was saying that we walk by faith, not by sight. We can't see the realities of heaven here 
but we know that it's there and we walk by faith even though we cannot see what he has promised for us there. Now, in order for us to walk by faith, we have to have and develop an understanding of the kingdom of God. We have to understand what it means to have access to the kingdom of God. And Matthew 6 breaks it down perfectly. And so we all know the word Matthew 6, where it says, seek first the kingdom and its righteousness and all other things will be added unto you. Right. But I'm going to take us back to Matthew 6, 25, and we're going to build our way up to that. And verse 25, it reads, and this is a New Living Translation. It reads, this is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life. Wife mentioned that during the prayer. Worried about things that don't matter. Anxious over things that don't matter, right? Do not worry about everyday life. Whether you have enough food and drink or enough clothes to wear, isn't life more than food and your body more than clothing? Verse 26, look at the birds of the air. Now he's giving us things that we actually can look, look at in the physical realm to prove his point. Look at the birds of the air. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns for your heavenly father feeds them. And aren't you far more valuable to him than they are? Do you really understand your value? As a son of God, as a daughter of God? Do you really understand your value? Do you really believe that God sees you as valuable? What do you really believe? Because that, that's what determines your ability to walk with God. What do you really believe? Verse 27. Can all of your worries add a single moment to your life? Jesus is asking rhetorical questions. Can all of your worries, what, what, what does it benefit you to worry? What's one positive thing that comes from worry? We know sickness comes from it. We know that st when it, from stress, you can get shingles from worrying. We know that you can cause yourself to go into mental breakdowns. You can have more anxiety. But what name one positive thing that has ever come from you worrying? So Jesus is painting the picture of the fact that worrying does nothing for your benefit. Verse 28, and why worry about your clothing? Look at the lilies of the field. Now he's given us another thing to look at. He's giving you examples of creation to show you what he has planned for you, right? To show you what he's able to do in your life. Look at the lilies of the field and how they grow. They don't work or make their clothing, yet Solomon in all of his glory was not dressed as beautifully as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully for wildflowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. Then he says, why do you have so little faith? What happened to you? Why do you have so little faith? I'm going to just let that breathe for a little bit. Why do you online? have so little faith. God gives us all of these examples. He created everything that we see, right? And then turns around and calls us his children. He's our, the creator of the universe is our heavenly father. Why do you have so little faith? Next time you find yourself worrying about something, ask yourself that. Why do you have so little faith? Verse 31. So don't worry about these things, saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. <laughs> so when you worry about the same things that unbelievers worry about, what separates you from them? People that don't believe in Christ worry about money and rent and bills. People that have a reality of who Christ is 
worry about rent, bills, and money. And don't we have access and to, to a reality that is not the world's reality? So why do we respond the same way the unbelievers do? When the same things occupy your mind that occupy the minds of a non-believer, nothing separates you. It's almost as if you don't have the reality of Christ or the power of the Spirit through which you can do all things. It's almost as if you don't have that knowledge. So if you're going to respond that way as a believer, what benefit is there to being a Christian? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers, but your heavenly father already knows your needs. Seek first the kingdom of God. Well, the New Living Translation puts it this way. Seek the kingdom of God above all else. Above all else. Yes. And live righteously and he will give you everything you need. So now that we have been reminded of that word, it's not the first time we've heard that word, but now that we've been reminded of that word, that should give us another way to approach life starting the moment we leave this door. Seek first the kingdom and his righteousness and all the things that you tend to worry about will be added unto you. You don't think God knows that you need food. You don't think God knows that you need clothes. You don't think God knows that you need shelter. You don't think God knows that you need provision. Seek first the kingdom. And all of those things will be added. It, it profits you nothing to worry and stress over the things that God already knows that you need. Seek first the kingdom. And so I want to break down what the kingdom of God is because we may have heard that scripture a thousand times without really understanding what the kingdom of God is. So we're going to get into it, right? When we think about the kingdom, that is God's absolute authority, his sovereignty, his absolute power. Right now, it might not always be easy to grasp because here we live in a democracy. We vote for a president. The Constitution was written, but there can be amendments added based on what the new norms are. There can be changes made based on what makes certain people comfortable and certain things that have been outdated. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. His word never changes. In this world that we live in, the president can have an agenda. He can want to do certain things, but guess what? He has to go through Congress, <laughs> the Senate. Things have to, you know, there are debates. Certain things are debatable, right? People can have uh, what do they call it? Alternative facts. The word of God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And his word is the absolute authority that should govern our lives. It doesn't matter how uncomfortable you become. It doesn't matter what the norms are in society. God's word is the same yesterday, today, and forever. It's not up for debate. You can't go to a town hall meeting and, and say you want to change the fact that I, I, I actually don't want to surrender my life to Christ. I, I actually want to do what I want and still go to heaven. Let's have a debate about this, Lord. There is no town hall for that. His word is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And as believers, the difference between those that claim to believe in Christ and still complain and worry about the things that the unbelievers complain about is that they do not have a kingdom mindset. And so when Jesus teaches us how to pray and he says, pray there, therefore in this manner, pray our father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, 
your will be done on earth as it, as it is in heaven. We, as kingdom citizens, are inviting God's ultimate authority to rule and govern our lives. So it doesn't matter what's legal. My standard is kingdom. It doesn't matter what's acceptable. My standard for living my life is kingdom. It doesn't matter what they're showing on the kids shows and, and cartoons and trying to make acceptable to my kids. As for me in my house, the standard is kingdom. And so the kingdom is God's ultimate authority. And if we want to be kingdom citizens and we want to receive everything he has for us, it's not optional for us to live kingdom by his principle or not. Now, don't get it twisted. You can do whatever you want because <laughs> he gave you the will to do so. And that's evidenced by what happened to Adam and Eve. He didn't prevent them from choosing to indulge in the fruit. He told them not to. And they had to reap the they had to suffer the consequences of their action because it was not in line with his instruction. Same is true for us. His word is the same. We can choose to align with it or not, but we have to be honest and accountable to the reality that we're going to have to answer for however we chose to live our lives. So what moves me as a kingdom citizen, I'm not moved by the things that other people are moved about. What motivates me as a kingdom citizen, I'm not motivated by the things that people are motivated about. I don't care if I have 1 million followers or 11 followers. I'm going to do what God has called me to do. Because there are people with a million followers, but where are you leading them? The word says for us to store up our treasures in heaven right? And what does it profit a man to gain the world, to gain a million followers, to gain a hundred million dollars, to gain a congregation of 300,000 members and lose your soul and lose yourself and get caught up in the limelight? Lewis is filling this message, man. I see you, brother. What does it profit you to gain the world, to gain everything, to gain all these things that non-believers concern themselves with and lose your soul. So the things that move the world doesn't move me. And we have to be ready and able and willing to adopt that and to accept that as our reality. Amen. And when we seek first the kingdom, it becomes crystallized. All those other things become added because we are no longer stressing over it. And all God wants from you is your faith. All he wants from you is to prove that you are trusting in him and that you, you believe that he will do what he said he would do, which is where this faith walk comes in. So when I walk by faith, I'm not deterred by chaos. I'm not moved or shaken by things that I see in the headlines. I'm aware. Like, don't be ignorant and oblivious to what's happening, right? Right. But don't be moved by it. So as a kingdom citizen, God's word is my reality. The worst thing that can happen to me on this earth is that I die. The best thing that can happen to me is that I go to heaven. <laughs> right? So there is literally nothing that I have to fear if I truly believe what my inheritance is as a kingdom citizen. Amen? So what do you believe? When you find yourself doubting, when you find yourself in fear... Ask yourself, because one thing we want to do here at Activate is be very self-aware. We're not going to walk around not knowing who we are and not doing self-assessments and evaluating our thought processes. What is it that is in your mind? What do you believe? Why do you have so little faith when it comes to this? And I just brought you through that. Check my track record. Why are you forgetting so quickly that I just saved your life? Why are you forgetting the fact that the, the, the fact that you have breath in your body right now is evidence that I have a plan for you? Why is that not enough? Right? I got to keep going. Galatians 5. 19 through 21. Now, 
This was the scripture that really got me to tighten up. Um, because I would have been one of the ones at the town hall trying to justify why can't I just do what I do? I'm not hurting nobody. I just like to party every now and then. I just like to hang out. I just like to have, I can't really see myself settling down with one, but I'm not going to mistreat, you know, women. Why can't I just do me and not bother nobody, right? Galatians 5, 19 says, when you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, that was me. Impurity, that was me. Lustful pleasures, that was me. Idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, that was me. Outbursts of anger, God's still dealing with me on that. Selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, that was me. Wild parties, definitely me. And other sins like these. But let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. There's a difference between entering the kingdom, which we will enter through salvation and water baptism and baptism of the Holy Spirit. But it's completely different to inherit the kingdom. It goes back to when Jesus says earlier in the chapter in, in the book of Matthew to store up your riches in heaven. Right. As we follow him, as we obey him, as we do the things that he's called us to do, we're storing up riches in heaven as we give to those in need, as we pay our tithes, as we sow, as we do the things that God has called us to do, we're storing up riches in heaven. And there is an inheritance associated with that. So there's one thing to enter the kingdom. There's a completely different thing to inherit the kingdom. And I don't know about you, but I want an inheritance. Say I want an inheritance. When it comes to the things of our sinful nature, and again, I remind you, we were born with a sinful nature. My kids are evidence. We were born with our hearts bent towards evil. So saying that I believe in Jesus and I dedicate my life to him does not automatically turn off the switch of your sinful nature. It takes walking and learning how to walk and applying the practices that, that we're learning and that we're hearing from God's word. But first, we have to be in God's word. Because how do we know what he says if we're not spending time with him? How do we know what his instructions are if we're not reading? And as we, we spoke last week about some of us needing to turn down the secular frequency of information that we're receiving and turn up the spiritual. Because the more I find myself in the world, the more worldly content I'm going to be indulging. The more worldly content I'm indulging, the more of that the more my mind becomes consumed with that. The more my mind becomes consumed with that, the more my knee-jerk reactions are now bent towards that. But as I start to fill myself with the word, as I start to spend more time with him, as I begin to allow his spirit to fill me and start to become more sensitive to his word, my, my discernment turns up. I'm able to be more, more receptive to his word more receptive to his voice, and I can make decisions and actions based on that and not the noise that I was previously accustomed to. Why is it so hard to get into the word? The reality is a lot of us would rather be entertained than enlightened. I was guilty. But as I get into this word, God continues to reveal certain things. And as I spend more time with him, he continues to confirm certain things about my life. And as I continue to walk with him, those things just start to unfold. You all are sitting in it. This is the evidence of obedience. I didn't want, I've shared this before, my desire wasn't to grow up and be a preacher. My desire, even 10 years ago, wasn't, even five years ago, wasn't to be that. 
But as God continues to reveal his plan to me, he continues to confirm what he has for me. And I cannot walk away from the things that God has told me to do because I've seen him be too faithful when I followed him before. And so whatever he is calling you to, and there is a specific purpose for every single person in here. There's a specific call on every single person in here. And whatever that is, your best life is going to be in alignment with that. The peace that comes to you as a result of that is going to deliver people. People are going to be curious as to how you're able to conduct yourself in a way where everything around you is being shaken. Because what can be shaken will be shaken, so that which cannot be shaken will remain. And when they see you as one of the things that are remaining, they're going to want to understand, hey, what is it about you that is so confident? What is it about you that is so bold to do things that nobody's ever done before? What is it about you that you can just be encouraged and, and smiling and with such joy in the midst of chaos? That is what's going to bring people to Christ. And when people are brought to Christ as a result of your obedience, that's storing riches up in heaven. So I'm rich in heaven. But I want more. <laughs> right. And that and that comes with obedience. So the way we're able to have this paradigm shift from doing life as we want to adopting this kingdom mindset is to have a kingdom perspective. This stuff isn't mine. This stuff is not the, this is whatever. I'm, this is a rental. This is an Uber. My house is an Airbnb. It's not mine. I can't take any of this stuff with me, right? I'm storing up treasures in heaven. I'm storing up riches in heaven based on my ability to be obedient and to die daily to myself. Why? Because Jesus died for me. couple more things I want to share we go home but here's a the reality is even in the day of Jesus when he was walking and leading his disciples it was easier to follow him then why because he was visible you could see him it didn't take much faith they saw him believers non-believers saw him healing people raising the dead, people flocking to him. It was easy to follow him. It was convenient. It was actually the cool thing to do at a certain point because he was the, he was the new wave. The multitudes would come out and the disciples were like, hey, Jesus, they want to come and see you. They checking for you. And Jesus is like, let's go on to the next town. I'm not pressed. None of this stuff impresses me. I am focused on the kingdom. I am here about my father's business. What motivates you? What motivates you? And does the outcome of that thing benefit you? Or does it advance God's kingdom? Another self-reflection question. So it's easy to overindulge in things that we see in this natural carnal space because it's what we see it's more difficult to focus your eyes and seek first the kingdom because we cannot see it however by faith we know that it's real and so the challenge for those that are kingdom citizens that are trying to go from quote-unquote christians to kingdom citizens is that we have to learn how to operate in this duality where our feet are here but our mind is kingdom And it requires transformation. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Right? Amen. We have to increase our appetite for the things of the spirit. I know too many rap songs by heart. I need to get more worship songs. I'm meditating on.
And what ends up happening, and this is real, start making it a practice, next thing you know, it becomes your norm. It becomes your norm. I used to have <laughs> a workout playlist, which was like 25% gospel, 75% ratchetry. And then I had a kingdom playlist. And over time, I noticed that my kingdom, as I continue to add songs to my kingdom playlist, that is now, has now become the playlist that I work out to. Because I prefer to hear that than somebody's face getting shot off while I'm trying to bench press. Right? Because you understand the impact of the, the content that you're taking in and you're more sensitive to it. You don't play around with that. And so develop and increase your appetite for things of the spirit. Delight in the law of the Lord. Meditate on it day and night. Hmm. Jesus even told Thomas in the book of John, verse uh, chapter 20, 29. He said, because Thomas was one of those disciples that said, I'm not going to believe Jesus has come back unless I can put my fingers through the wounds in, in his hand. I'm paraphrasing. Go back and read that thing. I'm not going to believe it unless I can touch the physical scars and wounds in his body. And so Jesus came back and allowed Thomas to put his hands in his womb. And then at that point, Thomas believed. He confessed that he was Lord. Jesus said to him, you believe because you have seen me. Blessed are those who believe without seeing me. So again, our challenge, how do we operate with the understanding that Jesus is real, that the kingdom is real, that the kingdom is something that we aspire to inherit, that the kingdom elements of it are things that we can actually pray to be pulled down and brought into this realm, right? How, how do we operate as carnal beings with a kingdom mindset? Because that's the goal. So here's some signs that you're walking by sight and not by faith. And we're going to get some, some practical biblical wisdom as to how we can flip that and start walking by faith and not by sight and adopting practices and principles of, of learning to walk with the kingdom mindset. Cool? All right. Signs that you're walking by sight, you're easily rattled. When you hear news, when you hear about another shooting, when you hear about another sickness, another outbreak, or, or you hear about something, you're easily rattled. That thing consumes you. You start researching and digging into it. You start, you know, you get, you get a, a, a bump on your arm. You go on WebMD and you, you diagnose yourself with death. Like you're easily like rattled and fearful. Right. That's a sign that you're living by sight. You're walking by sight. And not by faith. Anxious. With everything. Fearful. Somebody gets laid off at your job. Oh, my God. They're about to, I'm next. What am I going to do? You start scrambling. How's this going to get paid? How's that going to happen? I need to change this and change that. Again. I'm not saying that you should be ignorant and oblivious, but I'm saying that you should not be anxious. If we have a kingdom mindset, we understand everything is temporary. Your job is temporary. You're either going to retire, quit, get fired, or get laid off. But it's temporary. So however it ends, it is written. All of this stuff is temporary. Life is a vapor. Kingdom mindset says, okay, God, it would not have been my plan to leave this soon. I would rather have saved a couple thousand or a couple tens of thousands, but I trust you. Because if I'm not meant to be here and you're allowing this to happen, I'm trusting that as I walk with you, 
you're going to cause all things to work together for good. And I know that as I continue to seek you first, all these things that I naturally wanted to complain about and worry about, you're already going to add it. You're already working that thing out. That's kingdom mindset. Right? Unbelievers freak out when people get laid off. Not kingdom citizens. Because this is all temporary stuff anyway. You feel an absence of peace when you're walking by sight. When things around you don't look ideal, it impacts your ability to have peace. And our peace should not be tied to anything physical. For we know that you, God, are able to keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you. Why? Because he trusts you. So your ability to keep your mind stayed on God is evidence that you trust him. If you're focusing on everything else, just like the non-believers do, that's a sign that you don't trust God. And it's okay to be honest with yourself. If you say, I've been through seasons of my life when I didn't trust God, there, there, there could be many reasons for that. You might not have felt the hand of God on your life. You might have experienced something tragic and not known why God could possibly allow that thing to happen. You could have been abused and not know how that could possibly have happened to you. But God says, I am still your father, your heavenly father. He says that my ways are not your ways. If you weren't abused, maybe you wouldn't be as tough as you are to do the things I've called you to be. You wouldn't be able to have the voice that you have to impact those that are going through the th same thing that I helped you overcome. So we don't know why God allows us to do something or to do things or allow us to experience things. But at the end of the day, he is God. And the kingdom mindset says, God, I don't understand it, but I trust you. And so if you haven't had that level of trust with him before, this is an opportunity for you to have a fresh start with him. Because God's word cannot fail. For I know the plans I have for you, says God. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you future and a hope. So if you feel hopeless, that is not of God. If you feel that you have no future, that is not of God. That is a lie of the enemy. And it's just a matter of you getting into the presence of God, getting into the word of God to remind yourself that God has a plan and a promise for your life in spite of how you feel right now. That's kingdom mindset. So here's how we put to practice biblical strategy in walking by faith. We already said, delight yourself in the law of the Lord. Meditate on it day and night. Find joy in getting into your word. Fight past the natural temptation to doze off. Fight past the distractions that come up with your phone. Put your phone on silent. Put it away because everything that can interrupt you will interrupt you. But once you get into that word and God starts to have his way and start to reveal and give you revelation, it will change your life and you will not stop reading it. Find joy in being enlightened over entertained. And then Philippians 4, starting at verse 6, and I'll close with this. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything... By prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your heart and mind through Christ Jesus. That is a promise. That's a promise that, that is for you. Be anxious for nothing. In other words, don't worry about anything. Pray about everything. And the peace of God. This ain't just peace that comes with a paycheck. This ain't just the peace you get when, you know, the cop lets you off without giving you a speeding ticket. No, the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding. It doesn't make sense why you have this level of peace in this situation. That's the peace of God. Will guard your heart and your mind. 
protect you emotionally, protect you mentally through Christ Jesus, through your kingdom citizenship, through you walking in alignment. These are byproducts of kingdom citizens. Finally, brethren, meditate on these things. Whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report. If there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. We got to control again what we allow ourselves to meditate on. Amen.